Today, I'm delighted to be speaking with Fabian Hoffman, Doctoral Research Fellow at Nuclear Oslo and Oslo University, a defense policy analyst and expert on missile technology and nuclear strategy. Hopefully those details are correct. I got them from your LinkedIn and Twitter profile. But if you want to add any more detail, uh, do please give us a bit of a description of your background, Fabian. Fabian Hoffmann, as you just said, I'm a doctoral research fellow at the University of Oslo. Um, I'm also part of the Oslo Nuclear Project, uh, which is one of the very few centers of excellence, if not at this point, the only center of excellence in, in Europe, uh, academically speaking, that really focuses and, and looks in detail at uh, nuclear strategy, uh, arms control, non-proliferation, uh, nuclear weapons policy in general. My, my background or my, my PhD project itself focuses really on the intersection of uh, conventional weaponry, especially long-range strike weapons, how they intersect with uh, nuclear weapons and nuclear strategy. Uh, but that, of course, means also and in the context, especially, you know, of the Ukraine war, uh, right now I quite frequently uh, contribute to discussions that are generally about uh, missile technology uh, and the missile war in Ukraine. Well, let's jump in perhaps with one of the um, most uh, precarious problems of all, and that is the idea that Putin, and indeed actually the Western response to him, has eroded, if not destroyed, the idea of mutually assured destruction and the kind of nuclear deterrence umbrella we saw in the Cold War. Whereas it spells mad, and it might have seemed like madness, but actually there was quite a bit of rationality on both sides in the Cold War. It seemed that it seems that that philosophy has broken down, and then we are not dealing with the same geopolitical rationalities we were uh, in those decades. Um, I, I would actually say so in terms of a mutually assured destruction. I think that that as a policy or as a fact, um, you know, it's a bit of debate uh, whether whether mad really between the the nuclear great powers. You know, is this. Is this something that can change given the, the enormous nuclear arsenals that they still retain? Is it is it more of a fact or is it policy? In any case, I think it, it still holds quite a bit of value to explaining the competition between the United States and China or also NATO and Russia. I, I mean, in the end, uh, you know, even within the, the New START limits, uh, that's the, the main arms control treaty that is... Uh, you know, it's, it's a bit in limbo. Um, I mean, neither Russia suspended uh, or, or they said they would suspend adhering to the treaty limits, but they haven't gone beyond them. So the United States also hasn't retaliated. Um, basically, both sides right now, the United States and Russia, they have uh, around 1,500 nuclear warheads on around 700 uh, deployed strategic nuclear launchers, so ICBMs uh, and bombers primarily. And uh, then, of course, there's also France and the United Kingdom that, that each have, you know, a smaller nuclear arsenal, France, uh, with around, I think, 280 nuclear warheads, the United Kingdom with 200 nuclear warheads. Don't quote me on that. Um, they, they might differ a tiny bit, but it's it's around um, that that number. So um, basically, right, like both, both sides still have massive nuclear arsenals in the sense that you can blow each other up uh, many times. Um, so, so that hasn't really changed, right? And this is still this this driving fear of what's going on is partially driven um, by this idea that you know if things go south, if things escalate, we might have a massive nuclear war where in the end everyone dies. Uh, it's just over afterwards. Um, what is different from especially you know the the years after the end of the Cold War, and, and this really I think right now goes takes us a bit back to the early Cold War, right? Where people really are, are thinking about um, what happens below this threshold of massive nuclear war of MAD, of, you know, ginormous nuclear retaliation. Um, what do the web nuclear weapon systems do? And, and for Russia, I mean, they have enabled the invasion to some extent. They have stymied, to some extent, Western assistance. They have slowed it down. They have restricted the scope. Um, but of course, they also have a, you know, completely managed to, to halt them. Um, and then, you know, from a Western perspective, I mean, what we are really concerned is, is this, this big question, when would Russia go nuclear? 
um, and probably not you know immediately launching everything it has at the United States and Europe, but starting with with smaller nuclear weapons, um, so-called tactical or non-strategic nuclear weapons. Um, and you know again, these were discussions they had early on in the Cold War in the fifties and sixties. Might have heard of the the Cuban Missile Crisis, the Berlin Crisis. I mean, those were questions at the forefront back then, and, and they really come to the forefront again right now. Uh, and, and the reason, of course, is that it's a, a broader geopolitical climate that is just heating up uh, that, that wasn't there for a really long time. And we have a Russia that appears increasingly assertive and, you know, willing to use essentially whatever it has to, to push its objectives. And of course, there's a whole generation of people who have grown up without the nuclear threat, which, of course, hung over people who were, uh, you know, certainly living through um, the sort of 60s, 70s, Cold War, height of the Cold War period. So we see these Russian nuclear threats as something outrageous and extraordinary and uh, apparent. Um, but are they comparable to similar kind of nuclear threats made at the height of the Cold War? I spoke to David Satter the other day, who was a correspondent um, based in Moscow at the time. And he said, well, actually, you go back to Cuban Missile Crisis and, you, you know, you, you, the, the nuclear weapons were used um, as part of Russia's coercive control or coercive manipulation strategy back then with the most outrageous uh, threats being made on a relatively frequent basis. Yeah, so I mean that that's the thing with nuclear weapons, right? They're they're being used every day, not in the sense that we are exploding them left and right, uh, but they basically their mere existence shapes the geopolitical environment within which state actors um, interact with each other. Uh, so and they are a, a huge constraining factor at times. They're an enabling factor at times. They they can have many different implications. You know, just because they're not directly used by states doesn't mean that are not enormously impactful. Um, I, I think they almost always are. I think going back, you know, to, to the Cuban Missile Crisis and these early crises during the Cold War, um, what, what's quite interesting there is that really states and also analysts working on these topics, I mean, they they came in from, from a background that was, you know, entirely conventional. I mean, you saw massive strategic bombing in, in World War II, which demonstrated the potential of air power also the limits, and then suddenly there was this new tool, um, and no one really knew exactly what what this meant. Everyone just knew it was enormously destructive, and, and then you had like these first one or two decades after the end of the Cold War, where you really had at people trying to understand how this would shape the competition between the United States and the Soviet Union, or, or NATO and the Soviet Union, you know, NATO and the Warsaw Pact. Um, and and sometimes that that resulted in close calls. You know, I would say the the Cuban Missile Crisis, uh, most famous one, where where things probably got, you know, quite close to an escalation that could have resulted in nuclear war. Um, the Berlin Crisis uh, certainly also wasn't, uh, you know, for the lighthearted. Uh, but then after that, you know, something kind of interesting happens that these really intense crises they subside. We still had nuclear crises during the Cold War after the Cuban Missile Crisis, quite a few of them. But I think these really intense moments, um, they became less and less. You know, sure, 83, um, Abel Archer or, or you know, there, there were a couple of instances where, you know, some people say, hey, you know, nuclear use became a bit more likely again or not. But I think these, these really intense nuclear crises, they happened earlier. Um, then the Cold War ended. And as you correctly say, you know, we have a new generation of people who completely grew up without a direct nuclear threat in their life. And um, that's that's also for me, you know, generation, I was born 96. Uh, so, you know, for, for most parts of my life, I, I was not really confronted with that. Of course, you know, given my, my academic background, I confronted myself with it. But the, the direct day-to-day -day interaction with nuclear weapons wasn't really there. And I think in, in the meantime, and also on an analytical level, right, also for the people who lived through the Cold War, um, also those analysts, you know, with the end of the Cold War, Everyone thought nuclear weapons kind of irrelevant, push it aside, focus on other stuff. I mean, you know, plenty of scholars who were experts uh, on interstate uh, competition and, and nuclear war who, you know, early 2000s completely focused on, on terrorism and, and non-state actors because everyone said, oh, look, this is the, this is the big challenge of, of the 21st century. Um, no one cares about interstate war anymore and nuclear weapons, they don't matter. Um, and 
I think a lot of those lessons got lost. Um, and now we're in a position where we painfully have to relearn them, I would say. And, and that counts both for policymakers, but also par also partially for, for analysts. And right? I think this is something working in the nuclear policy field, this is something that can be quite frustrating that um, on the one hand, we have a scholarly academic framework within, you know, there are, us there are useful concepts and, and which provides a certain vocabulary, but then um, meaning is always contested, especially right now. Um, people are trying to, you know, figure out if the, the things that, that counted as, you know, a truth during the Cold War, is that still the case today? Do we have to rethink everything? Do we have to, you know, what can we apply from back in the days? And, and that makes everything really complex. And, and the implications, of course, is that I think what we're seeing on a policy level, that our decision makers really, really struggle um, to figure out partially what's what's going on um, with Russia and with its its nuclear threats. And let's turn to civil nuclear power, because I think that's an interesting question, isn't it? You've got the clear gradations of threat when it comes to tactical nuclear weapons, et cetera, et cetera. We'll come to tactical in a minute in the context of Belarus and so on. But civil nuclear power, is it true to say that that's always been seen as an extension of a country's influence, uh, but it's more of an economic and influence weapon. And yet here in the context of this conflict, we see the Chernobyl exclusion zone being occupied. We saw Russians digging trenches in the irradiated soil. We saw constant threats um, surrounding the Zaporizhia gas or Zaporizhia nuclear power station. Um, with the implication, if you're tuned into Russian threat, the implication is that, that they could uh, cause a nuclear incident that has plausible deniability. Yet at the same time, everyone knows they would have done it. A sort of Kohovka dam, but with radiation. Yeah, I, I would see those instances also as part as uh, the, the broader nuclear rhetoric of Russia and the broader framework of, uh, within the broader framework of, of threats that they employ. I mean, for Russia, right, the, the, the big issue is for Russia. Um, I, I have no doubt that they would they would like to use nuclear weapons, um, you know, not just in terms of threats, but actually employing them. And I, I have no doubts they would do that if they if they knew that it would further their cause. But the, the issue for Russia kind of is that employing nuclear weapons on the battlefield or let's say even for a signaling strike right where you just explode a nuclear weapon without anyone really dying that's enormously risky uh, because on the one hand right you you have um china and and india that have repeatedly stated um or pushed back against nuclear russia's nuclear rhetoric they were really not happy with that i mean you had xi jinping coming out uh, repeatedly saying that you know he will not accept these types of nuclear threats and this is you know not something that that we should do as an international community uh, and you know if russia would really go down that route and employ a nuclear weapon in whatever fashion i mean there's a big risk that that russia would immediately lose support of of china or or india um, and again right we, we can debate how how big that risk is and you know how much china really stands behind russia and maybe they would accept it maybe not um, it's it's about the prospect, right? Deterrence doesn't work. Deterrence is not about certainty. It's about prospects. And for Russia, there certainly is the prospect that if they employ a nuclear weapon for coercive purposes, um, rather than getting the Ukrainians to back down, they just antagonize the entire international community. Um, and, you know, beyond that, I mean, NATO has also stated, that, for example, especially the United States, that if Russia were to employ a nuclear weapon, that an intervention uh, of some sort becomes becomes a possibility again something that Russia probably would like to avoid. Um, so here's the thing, right? Like for Russia, it's really difficult then to really employ a nuclear weapon in the sense of really exploding it. What is perhaps a bit more credible of a threat is to create a nuclear incident, right? Where you where you bomb um, or explode uh, a nuclear reactor in Ukraine, where attribution. While, you know, it certainly would be, I would guess, relatively easy to, to establish with high likelihood um, that it was the Russians that did it. Uh, Russian propaganda will always try to push the counter narrative. And you always have, you know, some idiot journalists in the West, unfortunately, who, who take up that, that narrative and maybe not say, you know, oh, 
but the Russians are right, but rather say, oh, look, there are two sides and we don't know what's true. I mean, that's the real purpose, right, of Russian propaganda. It's muddling the water. It's not trying to convince you of their narrative. It's trying to, to get you to uh, basically say, oh, look, uh, one side says this, the other side says this. We don't know what, what's, what's correct in the end. And so maybe from the Russian perspective, right, this is this prospect is a, a lot more fruitful. And I think that's that's why they've they've been surfacing this type of threat over and over again, because they know that this is a lot more credible than actually the actual threat of employment of nuclear weapons. Another method that has been suggested of plausible deniability is to make Belarus nuclear armed and indeed you know, give the impression that it's a nuclear power in its own right, a standalone with the codes and the ability to operate them. Um, is it your view that essentially Belarus is nothing more than a Russian military base in these terms? Or if you want a harsher view, it's a, a base from which to launch terroristic operations. Um, how does Belarus play a role in Russia's nuclear calculus? And what it thinks it might get away with uh, and what it could get away with if in fact there was no pressure from china and others yeah i mean the role of belarus i i found really interesting throughout this conflict there, there were always um, waves where lukashenko tried to you know really separate and, and put boundaries between Belarus and, and Russia between himself and Putin. And then you have other instances throughout this conflict where it's abundantly clear that in, in many ways, Belarus is just a puppet of the, the regime in, in Moscow. And certainly, you know, what you said about Belarus being a military base, I, I think this is absolutely correct. Right? Belarus from the very beginning has constituted a large scale a staging ground for the Russian forces facilitating their invasion of Ukraine from different angles. Um, Russia has deployed S-400 air defense batteries over there, which really makes, uh, you know, makes makes air operations difficult in the north for, for Ukraine. And then recently, Russia has also started redeploying um, nuclear weapons, non-strategic or tactical nuclear weapons, lower yield nuclear weapons, to Belarus, um, they of course say it's it's about the threat that NATO poses and, and NATO forward deployed nuclear weapons. So for those that don't know, um, the United States forward deploys nuclear weapons in several European NATO states. I think it's so it's the Netherlands, Italy, Germany, Turkey, uh, and Belgium. Um, if I'm if I'm not incorrect, um, so please look it up. Don't quote me blindly on it, but I think it should be right. Um, and the, the idea really is, right, that uh, from a Russian perspective, they say, look, uh, NATO is doing that, so, so now we're doing the same. And there is a slight difference that NATO forward deployed nuclear weapons, their gravity bombs um, deployed on, on fighter aircraft, F-16s or uh, Tornado mainly, and now also F-35s. Uh, and the Russians, they forward deployed Iskander M short range ballistic missiles with nuclear warheads, or it's it's very likely. There's no 100% confirmation as far as I know, but basically the infrastructure movements, you know, heavily imply that uh, this type of deployment has has taken place. Um, so yeah, basically, I mean, I I think again, right? This is this is nothing crazy. This is nothing we we should get uh, paranoid about. I mean, this is again part of Putin's broader employment of nuclear threats and trying to create the sentiment in the West that at one point or another things might spiral out of hand and we have a nuclear war um, between NATO and Russia, which again, right, this is then really trying to, to get NATO decision makers to restri restrict their scope of assistance to, to Ukraine. And this is an interesting question, isn't it, where we sort of internalize the asymmetry of the situation. You will see people you know, whether they have come to this point of view themselves, or whether they're amplifying propaganda, they'll say, yes, but, you know, we're encroaching on Russia's sphere of influence. We're placing X, Y, and Z munitions. And of course, Russia feels threatened. And yet you won't see the argument made that actually Kaliningrad is armed to the teeth. There it is in Europe. You've got the Baltic jammer, uh, highly dangerous and, and offensive kind of behaviors you have this asymmetry in terms of the narratives that are told about those missile capabilities. 
Yeah, it's a horrible double standard. Um, you know, especially with with Kaliningrad, and now also in the context of the uh, deployment of what is called INF range missiles to to Germany from the United States. Uh, for those that, that don't know, the INF that stands for for Intermediate Range Nuclear Forces Treaty was uh, agreed in 1988 uh, between the Soviet Union and the United States. And basically, what it did, it um, it led to the the withdrawal and, and even destroy it all of the intermediate range ground launched missile capabilities in Europe. Um, you know, on NATO side there was famously the, the Pershing 2 um, and then the equivalent also on the Soviet side. The idea behind it was that you know these intermediate range nuclear forces they they can deploy these or employ these nuclear warheads um, within minutes so that leaves very little warning time makes a surprise attack potentially more likely and hence are destabilizing. Um, it was a really good treaty, right? Like it was also, I think, you know, one of the most effective arms control treaties ever created. I mean, it, it not only regulated a weapon system, it, it really destroyed a whole weapon system and removed it completely from the European continent. Now, the problem was in 2008, Russia started testing a, a intermediate range uh, missile system, also ground launched, uh, it was the, the 9M729 Novator ground-launched cruise missile, which goes beyond the range limitations established by the treaty, um, which are 500 to 5,500 kilometers. So basically what the treaty did, if you have a ground-launched missile system, it has to be either below 500 kilometers in range or above 5,500. Otherwise, it's illegal. Um, and Russia started to test the missile system that clearly was within this, this range. Um, and, you know, the United States and NATO over and over tried to approach Russia on the topic and be like, hey, um, what you're doing here, we believe is, is not within um, your rights as part of the treaty. Um, we want to have a look at the missile system as they were allowed to per the verification regime. Um, but Russia denied that. And, and, you know, that escalated throughout the 2010s and eventually led to the withdrawal from the United, of the United States from the treaty in 2019, which, you know, perfectly fine. I mean, if, if you have a treaty between two states and one does not comply, um, what are you supposed to do? I mean, just stay in the treaty and, and go for unilateral compliance. I mean, I know that's, that's what some people would have liked to see. I, I, I don't think that establishes the type of power and respect in the international system that you need at times. Um, so in any case, right, um, right now everyone is going a bit crazy about the United States deploying INF range missiles, ground launched missiles to Germany. But what they forget is that Russia has broken the treaty from 2008 onwards and has deployed these INF range weapon systems in Kaliningrad from 2014 onwards. Um, that they have cheated for, or, or well, they have done what we're now doing for a decade and no one really cared too much about it other than maybe a handful of people. And now that we're doing it, um, everyone's going crazy about it. And so I think that's a double standard that's really difficult and of course directly plays into Russia's hands. There's another interesting, I don't know if you call it a double standard or hypocrisy here, but essentially these weapons provide a umbrella of protection to Germany and Central Europe. Uh, and they do provide considerable deterrent power for a revanchist Russia. But then you have the Taurus missile system, which the Chancellor in Germany has categorically refused all the way, despite internal political pressure, to provide to Ukraine, to provide that so those same sort of capabilities to Ukraine to defend itself. How do you interpret this whole debate? And why is the Taurus actually so important when Ukraine has, you know, storm shadow scalp uh, capability. What is it about Taurus that brings so, them some sort of new extension to what they can do? All right. So let, let's start with what what Taurus could bring for Ukraine. Um, really quickly, there there are two two aspects that are are really important. The one is just arsenal size and arsenal depth. Um, I mean, Storm Shadow, Scalp EG arsenals in France and the United States, uh, sorry, in the United Kingdom, they're they're limited. Um, and I would say right now, basically, those two countries have delivered pretty much what they can without critically um, or, or running a critical shortage within their own arsenal that they would need in a, in a war fighting contingency between NATO and Russia. 
So there, there's not really anything coming anymore in terms of Storm Shadow, Scalp EG from France or the United Kingdom. And that was always clear from the beginning, right? Like as far as May 2023, when like these deliveries were first announced, um, I and others said, you know, like in the medium to long term, there have to be other states stepping up because that arsenal is not sustainable. Um, and Germany would, would be an obvious candidate for delivering the Taurus because A, the Taurus is, is pretty similar to Storm Shadow Scalp G. I come to the differences in a second. Um, but, but also Germany is pretty much the only country in Europe that still has a sizable cruise missile arsenal next to, to France and the United Kingdom. So it was really basically up to the Germans to, to step up here and, and take on that responsibility because they're one of the few states in Europe that, that actually can. So, so that's the argument in terms of quantity. And in terms of quality, Taurus offers some qualitative improvements, um, mainly because as a missile system, it's around five to 10 years younger. So, you know, some technological progress that was made um, was implemented in the meantime, and, and it's a bit more sophisticated in a, in a number of areas. The most important is the fuel system. Uh, without going into too much detail, uh, it, it basically, it is what, what we call a, a void and layer counting fuse system um, where it's not a, a timer right, that, that counts down from, let's say, 200 milliseconds to zero before the, the penetrator explodes. Um, rather, it's, it's a fuse that counts the different layers that are penetrated. And that can be really, really useful for engaging bridges, for example. Right? That's why people have said Taurus would be the, the best weapon system out there, basically, to destroy the Kirk bridge. Um, so, so that's the, the quality argument. Um, so overall, there, there is really a big need, as a big demand for Taurus in, in Ukraine, and, and Germany should have delivered it. Now, the reasons why, why it wasn't delivered, I, I think is, is, you know, obviously, I can only speculate to some extent here. Uh, because I, I don't know what exactly was going on in the, the Berlin bubble, but I think we have a pretty good idea. And as you correctly say, said, there was a lot of pressure within the coalition that, that pressured uh, Chancellor Olaf Scholz to deliver that weapon system to Ukraine sooner rather than later. Um, and yet Scholz pretty much held out. And he said, no, with me as chancellor, you're not going to get that weapon system. So, so I think this is really, you know, there was a decision that was made by, by Schultz and probably a, a close-knit group of advisors um, that were of the similar opinion. And, and the reason probably is that Schultz was too afraid of, you know, escalation in response. What, what would happen if this weapon system would, let's say, fly into Moscow for some reason? Um, what would be Russia's reaction? And what would that mean for Germany? And, and it is a bit of paranoia, I would say, because, you know, there, there were so many steps that could have been taken to prevent that. I mean, in the end, you know, uh, Ukraine basically offered also, together with the United Kingdom, that these missile systems, these Taurus missile systems, they're pre-programmed in Germany. So German engineers put in the targeting data, and then the British escort the weapon system through Ukraine and basically are with it up until the moment it is put on the fighter aircraft. So there's absolutely zero chance that even if the Ukrainians wanted to, that they could change the targeting um, data inside that missile and, you know, send it towards Moscow. Um, but of course, right, you don't get 100% certainty um, that this wouldn't happen. There's always, you know, a minuscule chance, 0 0.001, that something could go wrong. And the Ukrainians, you know, for some nefarious reason, figure out how to hack the missile and, and send it towards Moscow. And this tiny, tiny residual chance, I think this is what deterred Scholz in the end. Um, at least that is how I'm reading the situation. And, and I think the big issue was, and here's an interesting contrast now to the INF deployment. Um, what we criticized Scholz heavily for, myself included, is that Scholz for such a long time, he was dragging his feet. Um, and he, you know, he never really clearly stated what his position is. Rather, he, he let this debate rage on with like his ministers and the parliament and analysts and everyone chiming in and the media. And only really, you know, a couple months ago, after this debate was raging on for well over a year, he put his foot down and said, okay, no, we're not sending it. Um, and he has been criticized for that. And I, I think that's fair. 
And now here's an interesting contrast to the INF thing that happened. It's basically, you know, Germany coming out and, and without much fanfare, without much discussion, debate beforehand, just saying, look, um, these weapon systems are now deployed to Germany and that's it, end of discussion. Well, or, or, or rather there is no discussion, we're doing it. Um, Germany and the United States has decided to do that and we're going to go through with that. And I like that. that. That's great, right? This is, I think, one of the, the first time in a very long time where, where I applaud the chancellor. And it's such a 180 from his Taurus debacle. And I actually think, you know, given that he has, um, given that he, he, he has done it in the way he's done it, I think that can rebuild some credibility that has been lost with our Eastern European allies throughout the Taurus debate. Uh, be, because it really signals, right, that, that Germany is willing to step up and take on a leading role in deterring Russia, um, even without you know a, a massive drawn out domestic debate that at this point we're almost used to when it comes to Germany. Um, so, so this is actually quite positive as a development. And there's some interesting points there. I mean, let's focus on the opportunities because it's uh, it's good never to give up. I think one of the other British proposals was that we would take Taurus, uh, thereby. Uh, you know, creating a, a an intermediary step that would distance Germany and that those missiles would not be used in Ukraine's war, but that would free up our, as you say, our essential stocks of Scalp Storm Shadow, which are an older generation. We could provide all of those uh, over to Ukraine and we could stop a cup uh, on, on, on tourists instead. It seems that that offer was rejected. And not only that, the production line of the older scalp storm shadow missiles is still going, albeit I don't know what the output volumes are or whether those have been scaled up, but the Taurus production facility has not been renewed. Is, is it correct to say that has been really sort of, you know, mothballed or shut down? No, so so um, basically bo both production lines are still in terms of producing new missile systems. I'll, I'll get to that in a second. First, first to the proposal. Um, in the beginning, I was quite angry with the with the United Kingdom because I thought this is giving Schultz an easy way out. Um, I think they're making it too easy for him because I I thought he would jump at that opportunity. To be honest, or maybe not jump at it, but like uh, you know, after some pushing and uh, whatnot, he he would do that. Um, in the end, it, it turned out he didn't even want to accept that uh, because you know even that was too direct of an involvement in missile strikes against potentially Russia. Um, and 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 so you know that that was quite quite surprising. I I would say you know as much as I was against the proposal in the beginning, um, you know in the end of course like more missiles for Ukraine, whatever the framework uh, would have been useful. So yeah, it, it would have been better than than what we have right now. Um, on the production line, so um the the production line for Storm Shadow Scalp EG is also standing still, uh, in terms of producing new missile systems. What it is currently doing is is midlife upgrading existing Storm Shadow Scalp EGs. Um, so you know, basically, you're replacing a couple of parts that have become rather old and outdated, and you put in more up to date components in order to make sure that this missile system is still useful in in warfare for the next 10, 20, 25 years, however long. Um, and and. That's basically what's going on with Storm Shadow Scalp Ichi right now. It's also going on with Taurus right now, um, even though, again, you know, this is one of the few things completely incomprehensible that the, the government um, stalled this for roughly two years or over two years, refurbishing non-operational Taurus systems that were just rotting in, in storage bunkers, essentially. And now it appears that, you know, they're being refurbished and they're getting their midlife upgrade. But in general, I mean, this is, it's an absolute catastrophe. Uh, and I think it is one of the most incomprehensible things we have done on the European continent as a European whole. Those missile producing states that have the capacity to, to manufacture Taurus, Storm Shadow, Scalp, EG, so France, United Kingdom, and Germany, that they have not restarted their production lines months after the invasion started. Um, that that's almost a scandal. Um, I mean, a you would have needed that for Ukraine, um, given the arsenal shortages that we have, but also for yourself. I mean, what what is one of the number one lessons that we're learning right now from the missile war in Ukraine is that missiles are damn useful 
uh, for all types of military scenarios, offensive and defensive. And and one thing you you don't want to have have happen to yourself in in modern warfare is running out of missile systems. Um, and and you know we we haven't done that. We haven't restarted our missile production, meaning we're entirely dependent on on the United States and Israel right now for long range strike capabilities. And it cannot be in the interest of our of our continent. Um, and, and you know we, we're doing a couple other things now. I mean things have started to get rolling. So we're, we're, we're trying to invest again in missile programs and we're setting them up. Um, for example, there's now the European long range strike approach, short ELSA, uh, which is France, Germany, Italy, and Poland. If I'm not incorrect, I think the UK was also thinking about joining or maybe has already joined, um, where it's about you know developing a new ground launched cruise missile, but, but that's developing a new missile system. That's, that's years from deployment. What we could have done two years ago is restart our production lines for these air-launched cruise missiles that sure, not you know, not top-notch, not the most sophisticated capabilities out there anymore, but still perfectly fine for the next 20, 30 years, I would say. Uh, maybe not 30, but at least for the next 20 years. Um, and, and, and we haven't done that. And, and I think that is, that is horrible. Because if we had done it two years ago, the first missiles probably would, would come out of that production line or leave the production line probably within the next couple of months. Uh, and that would be really useful for Ukraine and really, really good for us. And of course, if we do uh, start this up in a reactive way, which is going to prove quite likely, especially given the weekend's events and the fears around a uh, US withdrawal from uh, you know European politics or even, dare I say, European protection, isn't there an issue that you know, if you're doing these things in a hurry, it's going to be massively more expensive, but also key chemicals, key components will not be available uh, in this sort of short time frame and in the quantities required. Well, that, that's exactly the thing, right? The, the, the biggest barrier to entry to missile production for us is not that we, we lack the, the, you know, the, the sophistication in, in terms of our production capacity that we cannot figure out how to build effective missiles. I, I mean, right, given that our production line uh, stood still for, for many years now, um, I, I would assume that the United States and, and also Israel is a, is a bit ahead probably at this point in missile technology. Um, but but I'm pretty sure that the British, German, and French engineers, they, they can still figure out how to make a really good missile. Um, the, the bigger issue is the, the supply chain. Um, and that was, you know, we also had that in terms of the Taurus debate quite a bit where, where people, you know, asked the manufacturer, hey, how long would it take for you to have the first missile coming from the production line after you get the order? Um, and, and they say the biggest issue here is the setting up the supply chain. Um, and so, for example, just getting the steel to to build the missile, the fuselage and, and also the penetrator, right? just the casing of the thing, um, Basically, this already would take one year of waiting time before you even get the steel. And then, you know, have all these other really technologically high-end um, components where you also have, you know, supply chains and sub-supply chains and, and whatnot. And, and to overcome that, yeah, you have to place the order early and also in significant numbers. Um, because obviously, the higher the order intake, the more planning security the manufacturer has, the more robust your supply chain and and that's the big issue for europe that we a we're not placing the orders as early as we should and when we place them we place them in small numbers which makes things more expensive um but but also the delivery times just become longer because of that uh and and unfortunately right things ever so slowly pick up in in pace but but it's it's so frustratingly slow that uh, it is sometimes I, I really wonder if we haven't heard the shot exactly here here in Europe like what what's going on with with Ukraine and the United States it's unfathomable to me and uh, something else which um, surely makes me think Europe needs to react now the CEO of Rheinmetall has been extraordinarily active not only in trying to put pressure on the German government to put long-term commitments for ammunition production refurbishing tanks and so on, but has actually invested in facilities 
in Ukraine itself, in some ways to circumvent some of the issues and uh, procedural slowness that keeps going on. Um, and there is the story that he's been targeted uh, as a potential uh, for assassination uh, by Russian uh, GRU or special forces or their proxies. Shouldn't this in some ways be a wake up call as well? Yeah, of course it should be. I mean, many things should have been a wake up call. Uh, quickly on the, the production capacity, right? We, we really scaled up artillery ammunition production in, in Europe. Um, the big problem, again, was that we started one and a half years after the beginning of the war. So we literally wasted 1.5 years before we, we got things rolling. Um, and, and, you know, that that cost a lot of Ukrainian lives. Uh, and obviously, this also really costs, uh, imposes costs in terms of our ability to effectively deter Russia. Um, in terms of this this hybrid warfare campaign that's going on, that, that Russia is conducting very, very effectively, right? As inefficient as they are and ineffective as they are at times on the battlefield, um, Russia really knows how to, to conduct these hybrid warfare campaigns against the West very, very effectively. And, and here's one thing I do not fully comprehend myself. Um, you know, in all these years before the war in Ukraine started, uh, where people have, you know, been saying that full scale major interstate war, you know, is no longer relevant. We're no longer going to see that. Definitely not on the European continent, but probably also not elsewhere. And um, everyone was, you know, like, again, looking at these non state type of threats, these hybrid threats, cyber threats, um, information realm. Uh, confrontation and and again right like these these are the things that that state actors and also analysts to a large extent then kept themselves busy with and, and now you can say you know you could make the argument oh look we, we were just like looking at something else we were kind of caught unprepared for this major interstate war stuff because that's not really something we've been considering but then at the very least we should have been really prepared for all this hybrid warfare stuff going on because right, this is then what we should have prepared for if that's what everyone was focusing on in the years before before the Ukraine war. But but it turns out we, we appear as unprepared for that as what is going on on the battlefield in, in Ukraine. And I, I think that's that's really surprising. And and again, I, I know you know I have, I have many friends um who conduct excellent research on, on hybrid warfare. Uh, and I'm just wondering, right? Like if I mean, someone in the governments of European states, whether it's it's Germany or or another country, um, must read what these people produce, right? And and must think about how to counter um, Russian hybrid threats. But it's it's not really taking place. I mean, our our silence and our inability to react to what Russia is doing really is deafening. I I, I cannot explain it differently. And uh, really. I had two more areas. One was the artillery, because it's interesting, isn't it? One, something else this war has shown is that Russia has scale, uh, scale in terms of the artillery units it can bring to bear, the vast stocks of Soviet ammo, and now from North Korea as well. But they don't seem to have tremendous accuracy. So whereas we often focus on the ratios of how many, you know, Ukraine is firing off versus Russia is actually the accuracy a far more indicator of being able to bring power to bear in the battlefield than sheer scale? Yeah, you, you need both. Um, and, and, you know, this was a massive advantage that Russia had, um, which was this enormous reserve arsenal from the Soviet Union, where, where it's not just, you know, millions of artillery shells, but also tens of thousands of of. Uh, armored personnel carriers and other types of uh, protected vehicles that they could, you know, within a certain time frame, mobilize and and send to Ukraine. And, and that's really something that that Russia can do once, and they've done it now. They will never ever be able to do it again because they cannot rebuild um, this this reserve stockpile. And, and that's also kind of the same for for artillery ammunition, even though that that could be a bit easier to to rebuild. Um, by the way, also, right, all these glide bombs that Russia is employing. Um, I mean, 
the idea came because Russia also was kind of running short on 152 millimeter artillery ammunition and other more traditional types of indirect fires. Um, and, and they saw that they had, you know, massive amounts of uh, gravity bombs from, from the Soviet Union in their arsenals. And they were thinking about, okay, how can we make them relevant to 21st century war fighting? And they decided to, to put a GPS seeker and, and wings on it and, and make use of them. Right. So, so this is a massive advantage on the Russian side that they just have the, the numbers, the quantity. On the other hand, right, this is this is really no secret. Uh, Russian military equipment is on a qualitative dimension vastly inferior to to what the West is producing in general, especially the United States and and European defense industries. But but even you know what's coming out of Ukraine at this point. Um, I mean, in some areas, especially I think in in drone small smaller drones UAVs, um, the technology. Is, is superior to what the, the Russian defense industries are producing simply because the system is, is much more nimble and, you know, is, is providing more incentives to rapidly uh, innovate. And, and you, you also see that. And, and Ukraine has very effectively been able to substitute uh, quantity for quality. But in the end, I mean, you, you need some type of, of mass mobilization in terms of equipment and also manpower in order to to withstand an enemy like Russia. And for a war on really an enormous front line, again, I think constantly baffled by the uh, the people fail to grasp the sheer scale of it. I mean, for those who studied World War I uh, in school and so on and got into it in detail, certainly the, the extent, the scale of it is reminiscent of, of um at least in terms of the the, the length of the front line of, of that. And we see certain superficial uh, similarities in terms of the stasis and the trench warfare. With all of this going on, and with the extraordinary evolution in drone warfare in a number of different environments, as well as, you know, the the mobility of World War II essentially kind of disappearing um, and new technologies returning us to a kind of stasis on the battlefield, um, how is this going to affect... The sort of research you're talking about earlier, you know, research, development, planning, procurement in the military, which tends to be quite clunky, often quite wasteful, lacking in transparency, and it's certainly by no means quick. Um, that would seem that this is going to have to change in order to react to the kind of warfare that is rapidly evolving uh, between Russia and Ukraine. Yeah, for sure. I mean, this is, you know, we don't know how exactly the, the war will end and, and what shape the, the two armies in Ukraine and Russia will be. Um, I mean, and certainly, you know, however the outcome, these armies will, will not be the ones that are equipped with, with the most high tech of weapons, probably. Uh, but we, what we can for sure say is that these will be the armies in Europe and, and probably the two armies all over the world that have the, the best understanding of, of warfare on a tactical and operational level. And basically all the other countries in Europe and beyond will, will simply try to catch up with that and, and try to implement the lessons learned in, in Ukraine. And I don't have a perfect overview on how these different countries are, are doing in that regard. Um, but, but certainly, you know, the integration of drones, for example, UAVs, uh, smaller and bigger ones, on a large scale, I mean, that is that is trailing. Um, that's probably not happening as fast as it should. But then again, right, these are peacetime armies that are innovating in the United States and Germany and France and the UK, whereas uh, Russia and Ukraine, they're in, in full-scale warfighting mode. And obviously, uh, tactical operational level innovation is happening a lot quicker, quicker in, in these environments. Well, I think uh, I can imagine a, another conversation purely around drone warfare and the evolution of tactics and technology there and the synthesis between um, you know, the military, what's happening at the front line and the so-called so entrepreneurial and civic society class. There's an extraordinary kind of dynamic going on there. We'll have to save that for another episode, I think, though. But it's been a huge pleasure welcoming you to the channel uh, and so much, I think, useful information for myself and the audience, uh, a lot of detail which you don't normally uh, get to hear or read about. Um, massively helpful. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you so much for having me.